Hi, this is Pastor Tim Bagwell. I'm so glad that you're watching. I've got such an incredible word to share with you today. I believe it's going to impact your mind, your spirit, your body, your finances, because there's something about the word. The word will make you free. I know that God cares about you and he cares about your family. He wants to touch your loved ones that are lost. He wants to heal the family member that's sick. He wants to help you be the person that God has called you and ordained you to be. I know that what you're getting ready to hear is going to liberate you, encourage you, and give you strength to face the battles that you're about to face in the future. Well, remember this, we care about you, we're praying for you, for your family, and most of all, remember, you are who God says you are. All right, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11 tonight. Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to read verses 5 and 6. By faith, everybody say by faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him amen praise god well over the last couple of weeks i've had the privilege and honor of sharing with you on wednesday nights um, about faith we're looking at what kind of faith did these people have to fulfill the call of god in their life and to fulfill destiny and so a couple Wednesdays ago, we were looking at the woman with the issue of blood. And of course, we understand that she was an extremely desperate and needy woman. She had spent all of her money, everything that she had, went probably to the finest doctors in that area. And the Bible says she got no better, only growing worse and of course, having spent all of her money, I would guess that probably meant she was poor as well. But then the Bible says, but she heard about who? Well, four of you know, the rest of you are about to find out. She heard about, everybody say Jesus, amen? And the Bible says that she said that if I may only touch his garment, I will be made well. And as we know the story, she made her way through the crowd. She grabbed a hold of the hem of his garment, and instantly she was made well. And we asked this question a couple weeks ago. Where did this woman get that kind of faith? Because she didn't go to Bible college for four years. She was not a minister. Uh, she had not... Uh, listened to Jesus preach probably before. She had just heard about him, probably that he was a healer and a miracle worker and one that could raise the dead. And so when she heard about Jesus, faith rose up in her heart and it moved her. Everybody say it moved her. It moved her to take action in the direction of her miracle, right? So it's not that she just had faith in her heart. It's not even that she just said with her mouth, if I could just touch him, I'll be made well. It was one more step. It was faith, it was confession, and it was action. You know why? Because faith without works is dead. And if she had not taken that final step of action towards her miracle, towards Jesus, who is the healer, she could have sat there 
having faith in her heart, saying, if I could just get to him and touch him, I know I'll be made well, and watch Jesus and the multitude walk right by her, and she would have been in the same condition as she was before Jesus ever got to her town. Is anybody listening this evening? Amen? But she didn't. She took one more step of faith, and she got in there, and she got her miracle. Now, you might ask, well, did this woman live for the Lord the rest of her life? Did she fulfill the destiny that God had planned for her life? Well, just to be flat out honest, we really don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us her faith was for a desperate need in her life, and her prayer and her faith was answered. Amen? But I suspect because she had that kind of faith and got the kind of miracle that she had, that she did live out her life serving the Lord, having faith in him, and doing what God had called her to do. And think about this. There, there we go. I hear the worship up there. I thought, whose phone is going off? It's not a phone. It's them. <laughs> but think about this. The story that we're talking about right now took place 2,000 years ago, almost. And here we are nearly 2,000 years later, and we're still talking about the woman with the issue of blood who had faith and got healed. Hello? She made it in the Bible. That sounds like fulfilling destiny to me. How about you? Then last week, we talked about two people, a, a man of faith and a woman of faith. We talked about Enoch who the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about him, but it says some very powerful and important things about him, that he had a testimony that he pleased God. And how did he please God? By faith. And remember, we're not going to re-go re over everything that we said last week, but remember, Enoch had a son. Does anybody remember what that son's name was? Methuselah. And there's several interesting things that I just briefly, quickly want to bring out again. Methuselah, number one, was the longest living man recorded in the Bible. He lived 969 years. So any of you that are about 69 years old, maybe give or take a few years, and you're starting to complain about a few aches and pains and everything, hey, honey, you still have 900 years to catch up with old Methuselah. Amen? <laughs> but there's something else that's very interesting about Enoch's son. For the Bible says that Enoch lived 65 years, had a son named him Methuselah, and then for 300 years he walked with God. It doesn't say that he walked with God for the first 65 years, but it does say that he walked with God after he had his son Methuselah. And the name Methuselah is very significant because it means when he dies, it will fall. So when Methuselah died, if you do your math and chronology um, and genealogy in the Bible, you find that after 969 years, Methuselah died. And you know what happened when he died? It fell. What fell? the judgment of God, and the floodwaters of Noah, of Noah. But it doesn't end there because we went to the book of Jude and we saw that Enoch also had a vision of the Lord returning from heaven with ten thousands of his saints. You know what that was a vision of? The next coming judgment. So we had the judgment during t the time of Noah, but how many of you know there is a judgment coming at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the seven-year tribulation period? And when Jesus comes back on his white horse as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he will bring judgment to this unbelieving world. And guess who's coming with him? Ten thousands of his saints. How many of you believe that you're one of those ten thousands? Amen? So where did Enoch get his faith? Well, he didn't have a Bible to read because it wasn't yet written. He didn't have a Bible school to go to because there were none. You know what he had, though? He had a face-to-face -face relationship with God by faith. Hello. And he served God, and God took him, and he never even saw death. Then we talked about one of my favorite women in the entire Bible, and that is Rahab 
the harlots. You might go, well, Pastor Mike, couldn't you have chosen somebody of better pedigree than that? Maybe like Queen Esther or Mary the Virgin, the mother of Jesus, or somebody like that. But you know what? God can save anybody. Amen? And if he could save Rahab, he could certainly save you. Say amen. <laughs> and he could serve Colonel Nelson, save Colonel Nelson here in the front. He said it himself. Amen. Praise God. But I love this woman for a few reasons very briefly again. Number one, she was a heathen woman. She was not a Jewish woman. She had no part of the nation of Israel. She could not lay claim technically to the promises and the covenant that all the Israelite or Jewish women had with God through the law of Moses. But you know what? She had faith too. And you might go, well, where in the world? Did this heathen woman living in Jericho, a walled city, get faith from? Well, we're not going to turn there now, but we went back, I believe it was to the book of Joshua last week. And it says there, when uh, Rahab is talking to the Jewish spies that she had hidden in her house, she said, we have heard what the Lord your God has done for you. And for the majority of the people in Jericho, it made them afraid and they were trembling and couldn't sleep at night because they knew that they were about to be conquered and that probably meant certain death. But you know what? There was one woman, Rahab the harlot, that said, bless God. I'm not going to die with all the rest of these fools. I'm rising up in faith faith how did she get faith she heard and what does the bible say how faith comes faith comes by hearing how did the woman with the issue of blood get healed she heard first that jesus was a healer how did enoch get faith he heard the voice of god he had dreams and visions of what god was about to do and he believed it and now rahab the harlot heard about god the god of abraham Isaac and Jacob and she said hey I am no dummy I know I'm a heathen woman I know I'm a sinner I know I've done a lot of things wrong in this life but somehow faith just rose up when she heard about God and she took a hold of God and she made the spies swear that she and her family and all of her household would not perish with the rest of the people of Jericho because she had been kind unto them and you know what God did God honored her faith and saved her but not only that she married a Jewish man later and she became the great great grandmother of no one less than King David himself the giant slayer the Goliath killer David was the great great grandson of this Rahab the harlot and if that weren't good enough, which that is pretty far out, she also, through many more generations later, became the ancestress of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Whew. And how did that all happen? By faith. Hey, folks, listen to me tonight. I want you to understand that faith is an awesome thing. Faith can open doors that no other key will open. Faith can bring miracles and healings and deliverances when there is no hope in the natural. It can cause a woman that the doctors have written off to die because she had an incurable disease and cause her to be healed in an instant. It can cause... Any one of us that has an impossible situation in our life to make the impossible become a reality. Are you listening tonight? Because God is pleased by faith and God honors faith wherever he finds faith. Now you may say, Pastor Mike, I hear you. I see it here in Enoch and Rahab and the woman with the issue of blood and the people you're about to talk about tonight. 
so sure about myself. Well, you know what? Tonight, we're going to kick doubt and unbelief right out the door, and we're going to rise up in faith. We're going to take hold of the promises of God. We're going to be as radical as Rahab, Enoch, and the woman with the issue of blood. We're going to live our lives for Jesus Christ, and we are going to see the will of God fulfilled in our lives. Amen? You may say, well, but... But Pastor Mike, that was for King David and for all the heroes and men and women of faith of the Bible. Well, aren't you a man or a woman of faith? Aren't you a child of God? Does God not have promises for you? Does God not have a purpose and a destiny for you to fulfill? Sure he does. But there's only one way to get it done, and it's the big F word. Amen? Everybody say faith. Amen. Praise God. So tonight, I thought, you know, since we're still talking about faith, I mean, we've talked about two little-known people, Enoch and Rahab. Well, why not talk about somebody, a couple people that are really well-known in the Bible? And that, of course, would be Abraham and Sarah, the father and the mother of faith. Amen? It's not that there weren't other people before them that didn't have faith, but they're kind of like the ones that God made these awesome, awesome promises to and started a brand new race of people and a brand new nation of people called Israel. So let's read about them a little bit tonight. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, go down to verse number 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Ladies, does that sound like some of your husbands when you go out in the car sometimes? You're just going out, but you're not sure where he's going. No, I'm just kidding. All the women are laughing. Verse number 9. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Whoa. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, let's just say way past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore." And then skip down to verse 17. And by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, and Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Amen. Abraham and Sarah, praise God. A man and a woman of faith. And here's one of the things I really, really like about all these men and women of faith listed here in Hebrews 11. There's many of them. We don't have time to get into all of them. And how many of you know that's not even all the men and women of faith in the Bible? That's just some of them, and it certainly doesn't even include all the other men and women of faith throughout history. Hello? But there's a special man and a special woman named Abraham and Sarah, and what I love about these men and women is this. They were just ordinary folk like you and me. Ordinary. Everybody say ordinary. There's nothing real special about them. As a matter of fact, uh, you can write this down if you would about Abraham and Sarah. Here's a few things you ought to know about them. Number one, he was a heathen man before God got a hold of him. Just like uh, like, uh, Rahab was a heathen woman. He was a heathen man and his ancestors worshipped other gods. Uh, Many scholars who studied this out say that his ancestors worshipped the moon god. 
And where do you find all that? Well, just jot it down. You'll look it up later. Joshua chapter 24 and verse number 2. Joshua 24, 2. So get it out of your mind that Abraham always believed in the true and living God, that he always uh, knew who the real God was. He didn't. Next of all, what I like about these people is they were not well known and really lived in obscurity. Think about that for a minute. Who were Abraham and Sarah before God got a hold of them? Nobody in particular, just common folk every day, living life, you know, trying to take care of business. Nothing special about them. And check this out. If they had not had faith in God's promises, you know what would have happened in their life? They would have remained in obscurity and their names would have been forgotten very, very quickly in history. Do you know how long ago Abraham and Sarah lived? 4,000 years ago. Now, folks, there's not a whole lot of people I can remember who lived 4,000 years ago. But here we are, 4,000 years from that time, still talking about Abraham and Sarah. Here's another thing that I like about these people. None of them had great faith to begin with. None of them. None of them. Sounds like us, right? And one final thing about Sarah. Sarah had been barren her entire life. She could not bear children. And so when God made these promises to Abraham and Sarah, it sounded like, you know, something out of uh, a fairy tale, something out of science fiction. I mean, how could that be? We're already old, God, and you're telling us we're going to have a child and that our family is going to be a blessing to the entire world? Where did they get that kind of faith? How did they get faith to become some of the most well-known well-known people on the planet. Did you know that Abraham actually is the most well-known person on planet Earth tonight? You might go, oh, no, he's not. My Jesus is the most well-known person on the planet. Ah, no, no, no. Not that Abraham is greater than Jesus, but here's why Abraham is more well-known than even Jesus. Because on our planet tonight, there are over 15 million Jews who know who Abraham is, who believe in him, and claim him as their father. Hello? Number one. Number two, there are about 2.2 billion Christians on planet Earth that, yes, believe in Jesus, but they also know about him. Abraham, and that 2.2 billion includes Christians of all stripes, okay? Not just true born-again Christians, but Catholics, Orthodox, Episcopalian, Baptist, Methodist, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, all of them that claim to be Christians, about 2.2 billion. And then there's an additional 1.8 billion people on planet Earth that are Muslims who also believe in Abraham and call him their father. Did you know Muslims believe in Abraham and call Abraham father? But not through Isaac, like the Jews or the Christians do, but through another son of Abraham. Does anybody know who that son is? Ishmael. And what does the Bible tell us about Ishmael? Was he a son of Abraham? Yes. But was he the son of promise that God had made a promise to them? No. He was the son of the flesh, whereas Isaac was the son of promise. And when God had made promise to Abraham and Sarah, Sarah and Abraham got a little antsy because it was taken a little bit too long. And every time they checked their pregnancy test, it said negative. Now, how many of you know after you check about four or five times, you start getting a little antsy and a little upset about it, right? So Sarah took things into her own hands, came up with a plan which sounded really good, and she said to Abraham, here's my plan, go sleep with my handmaiden, my Egyptian, I believe she was, if I'm not mistaken, but anyway, a handmaiden, and, and, and have a child for us through her. 
Abraham said, oh, well, that sounds good. I mean, God didn't make a promise to us. So if it doesn't work this way, we'll make it work that way, right? And how many of you know, how many of you know Ishmael has been a thorn in the side <laughs> of not only Abraham, but a thorn in the side of humanity ever since? Make a mistake? Sometimes you live with the consequences. We've been living with that consequence for 4,000 years. But in it all, I believe God still even has a plan for Ishmael and for Muslim people. Amen. How many of you know God loves Muslims? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So how did Abraham and Sarah get faith? Well, you know, the answer is real simple. The same way. Everybody else got faith. Turn with me real quick, because we don't have much time. Back to Genesis chapter 12. Back to the original story in the Bible. Genesis 12. And what are the first few words in Genesis 12 and verse number 1? Now the Lord had said to Abram. Hmm. So in other words, the Lord is speaking, and what's Abram doing? He's listening, or in other words, he heard. Isn't that what the woman with the issue of blood did? She heard about Jesus. Isn't that what Rahab did? She said to the spies, we heard about the Lord your God and what he has done for you. We heard and now the Lord begins to speak to Abraham, or Abram in, in this instance, and the Lord said to Abram. And what did he say? Well, look at it real quick here. Get out of your country and from your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who curse or bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So he's gonna make him a great nation, and in Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed. How would that come to fulfillment? Well, you and I understand that. And Noah, I don't think Abram quite understood it when God said these words. It was a revelation that would come to him over several decades that he would finally grasp the fullness of it. But of course, it would be through uh, Jesus who was descended in the natural from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, Judah specifically, because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of of Judah, amen? Hallelujah. But Abram was probably scratching his head and going, but, but God, how could these things be? My wife and I are already old because the next verse says that Abram was 75 years old when God spoke to him about this, which would make Sarah 65 years old, which is not a good time to bring up the subject of having our first child. Amen? Amen. Ladies, you needed to help me a little stronger there. Come on. All the ladies say amen. amen. Praise God. God had a plan. And without turning back to Hebrews 11, it says that Abraham obeyed God when he was called to, a go, to go to another country not knowing where he was going. In other words, Abraham had never been to Canaan. He had never been to that part of the Middle East. He had not visited. He couldn't look it up on the Internet. He didn't know anything about it except maybe what he had heard, a few things. But yet God said, get up out of your country, leave your father's house, and go to the place which I've called you to go. And what does the Bible say? By faith he obeyed. Faith arose because he heard the voice of God. And then he agreed with that, and he started putting feet to his faith. 
Because faith without action, faith without works, faith without obedience is dead. Hello? Who? And then it goes on to say in Hebrews 11, he dwelt in tents with Isaac and Jacob as a nomad, basically, and he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. You know what? He had such faith in his walk and his relationship with God. He knew there was more than just living in tents, but he was willing to live in a tent because his faith reached out because God had shown him one day there was a city coming to planet Earth. I believe the book of Revelation talks about it. It calls it the the new Jerusalem descending out of heaven, that was the city that Abraham was believing God for. Amen? So God makes these awesome promises to uh, Abraham here. And then turn over with me just real briefly to the 17th chapter. The 17th chapter of Genesis. Look at verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Hadn't God said that to him already? Yes, he did. No longer shall your name be called Abram. Do you know what Abram means? Abram means exalted father. No longer shall your name be Abram or exalted father, but your name shall be called Abraham which means the father of a multitude or the father of a nation or many nations. For I have made you a father of many nations. Now that is mind-blowing because this guy's old and doesn't even have his first kid yet. And he's going to be the father of a multitude and the father of many nations. That's going to take some faith, right? I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land. Everybody say the land. The land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan for how long? As an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, just for a quick question here to you scholars, uh, do you think when he says for an everlasting possession that might even include 2018 and beyond? Hmm. Are there problems over in the Middle East right now regarding Israel? Of course there are. But you know what? God said right here, 4,000 years years ago I am giving you this land as an everlasting possession does that mean that everything the Israeli government does and 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 all that they do is 100% in line with the word of God no 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 because most of the land uh, the nation of Israel are not believers in the Lord Jesus Christ anyway and a good portion of Israelis today are secular rather than religious But you know what? God is doing a work in that land, and he has given Abraham and his descendants that land forever. Go over to verse number 15 then. And then God said to Abraham, as for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. And what did Abraham say in verse number 17? Hallelujah, God. I believe you. Let's get on with it. Is that what Abraham said? (laughs) And then Abraham fell on his face and laughed And said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years, so we're 25 years on from chapter 12 now, 100 years old, and shall Sarah who is 90 years old bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, no, Sarah your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac or Yitzhak in Hebrew. You know what Yitzhak means? Laughter. 
But you know what? I think it's a play on words. It's going from a laughter of doubt and unbelief to a laughter of faith and joy in what God was doing through her. Amen? Yitzhak, laughter. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. Turn with me now as we're getting ready to finish up here tonight to the book of Romans. And there's so, so much we could say about Abraham and Sarah. Obviously, in about 45 minutes, there's just no way to get through it all. But we're making a few uh, important points here tonight. Amen. Romans chapter 4. Look at verse number 16. Speaking again of Abraham. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, God. Now listen to this for a minute. When God said these words to Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations, it had not yet come to pass. But God was declaring it. Why? Because look at the next part of this verse here. Verse number 17, it says, God who gives life to the dead. Although Abraham and Sarah were still alive physically, their bodies were dead as far as it was concerned in the ability to have children. Hello? So God gives life to the dead, which he did for Abraham and Sarah, and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Do you know how faith speaks? It speaks as if it's already done. Because when God said to Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations, in the natural and in Abraham and Sarah's experience, it had not yet happened. But as far as God was concerned, once he said it, it was as good as done, although in the natural it had not come yet to pass. Why? Listen to this, very important. God had spoken. Abraham and Sarah had heard, but faith had not yet arisen in their heart when God said that to them originally. It was going to take a while. It was going to take some more struggle through the doubt and unbelief, but they finally got to a point where not only did they hear the word of God and the promise of God, they accepted it as truth by faith because faith arose. How? Because they kept on hearing the word of God. God didn't just say it to them once or twice or ten times. He kept on repeating it. He kept on repeating it. He kept on showing them. And one day faith arose in their hearts. And they said, you know what? I think God is, really means what he's saying here. We better get with the program. If he says it, he means it. All we got to do is believe it, receive it, and it's done. Bam. Bam. Sarah went into the ladies' room, pulled out her 134th test, did what she did with those things. This time, she probably was about to throw it in the trash. She looked again, and she's like, oh, Abe, Abe. And he's like, what? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. The test says positive. Whoa. God brought his promise to pass when they believed. For God calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, speaking now of Abraham, contrary to hope, in hope, believed. Well, what's that mean? Well, there's two kinds of hope being talked about here. The first kind is natural hope. The second kind is supernatural hope. 
in the natural, how many of you know there was not even a shred or a drop of hope for Abraham and Sarah to have a child? Not any hope. But they pushed back the natural hope and looked forward by faith to the supernatural hope of the promise of God that Abraham was a father of many nations, that he would produce kings out of his lineage, Jesus being the greatest of all, amen, David being another one. Many other kings came through Abraham's lineage, and by faith it came to pass, because it says, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body, already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but here's three things he did. You might want to jot these down. These are good. Very short, very powerful. Number one, he was strengthened in faith. Strengthened. In f How did he do that again? He didn't have a Bible to read. He couldn't turn on the TV or uh, open his laptop and, and watch TBN or Daystar or his favorite preacher. There wasn't any. He couldn't go to his neighbors for an encouraging word because they didn't believe. But God kept dealing with him. God kept speaking to him. You know what God's doing in your life? He keeps dealing with your heart. He keeps dealing with your life. He keeps speaking to you out of his word and by his spirit. He's trying to elevate faith in your life so that he can get his will done for your life. You might say, well, I'm not called to be an Abraham or a Sarah. Thank God. But you're called to be a you and you has more to do than just sit in a pew at church. You needs to get up and start taking some steps of faith so that you also can fulfill destiny. Mm -hmm. You still love me okay? Now maybe you never even loved me at all. I don't know. That's your problem. <laughs> he was strengthened in faith, number one. Number two, he gave glory to God. You know what he started doing? He started having worship sessions with God. He didn't have a band. He didn't have a guitar. He didn't have a harmonica. He didn't have a choir. He didn't have his favorite CD or iPod or, or any worship music outside of what could come out of his innermost being. And I could see Abraham walking around his tent, going out into the desert, going out into the fields and just beginning to worship God and give God glory. Lord, I don't know how this can all come to pass. It sounds too good to be true, but you know what, God? You've been dealing with me for 25 years since I was 75. Now I'm 100 years old. I know I'm slow, God, but nonetheless, right now I believe. I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it. I praise you. I worship you. And the next thing that Abraham heard was, ah! His wife screaming, running out of the tent with the positive test. Look! Look! Amen. Almost done. Verse 21. Third thing, and being fully convinced. Not a little convinced. Not almost convinced, but being fully, or another word would be completely, absolutely convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. How can we get that kind of faith? Well, unfortunately, for too many Christians, we know more about sports statistics than we do about the scriptures. Now, not here at Word of Life. I'm talking about, you know, some odds and ends Christians maybe up in Idaho or 
over in South Dakota or somewhere like that. But Men, I think some of us know more about the sports stats of our favorite team and our enemies than we do about the Scriptures. Ladies, some of you might know a little bit more about the latest fashions than you can tell me about what the Word of God says. And that's not a good thing. There's nothing wrong with enjoying a sports game. There's nothing wrong with dressing nice. There's nothing wrong with a lot of those things. But if those things supersede your understanding, your knowledge, your time, your energy, your money, more than your walk with God, then you've got everything kind of topsy-turvy and upside down and the cart in front of the horse kind of a deal. Amen? I want to challenge you tonight, because we're about to pray. It's 8.11. By 8.15, I plan to pray. Just a few minutes, and then we're taking the offering, and we're going home. But I want to challenge you tonight for you to just personally examine your own life and see where you're at in your walk with God and your faith walk, especially, all right? You know, nothing wrong with watching a movie. Now, you do have to be a little discerning nowadays about what you do watch, what you don't watch, right? Nothing wrong with watching a movie, but if your weekends are always consumed by watching three, four, five movies per weekend, which would take probably, you know, if you're watching five movies, a couple hours each, that's 10 hours of your time, and you don't even spend 10 minutes over the weekend with the Lord in His Word, in worship, in prayer, in believing God for certain things, or even just coming to church on a Sunday and then getting involved in the ministry, well you probably have your priorities way out of line. And if they're way out of line, how do you expect to have great faith to believe God to bring his word to pass in your life? Well, bless God, I'm a member of Word of Life. And I come to Pastor Bagwell's church. And we know he's not a short order cook. He only serves filet mignon. And if I'm not sitting in the pew, I'm watching online. Well, that's good. But how many times do you open the Bible and you get your face into the Word of God for yourself? Are you listening to me tonight? And so tonight, we're going to take just a couple of minutes. If I could have somebody move the, these two out of the way here, because we're going to need a little... Not you, honey. Guys, guys. Men. Abraham's, not Sarah's. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. I want to challenge you tonight. What things do you need to believe God for in your life? And you know, if you need a car, great. Faith can work for that. You need a new car, let's believe God for that. Let's get the car. But let's move beyond the new car and the new dress and the new shoes and the new suit and tie and all those things. Let's believe God for destiny. Let's believe that God has something more for us to accomplish in this life than just attending church and that God might ask us to do something that we don't want to do or that we don't feel we're qualified for or prepared for. And you know what? Faith takes a step out there into that unknown territory too. Do you know how I've gotten to this position where I've been today? It's simply by faith. It's simply by obeying God. It's simply willing to say, well, I'm not the sharpest uh, knife in the block. And, uh, you know, I'm not uh, the smartest guy in the church. And, you know, there's others that know more than me. But I'm willing to do whatever. And so I've seen the hand of God move me and direct me and lead me and guide me. And those of you that know me know that one of the greatest calls in my life is to travel all over the world, to preach the gospel, to train leaders, to raise up the church, preach the gospel. And did you know that by faith over the last 30 years, I've been to approximately 22 nations on about 78 mission trips? Whoa. How did that come to And that's just part of what God has done in my life. By faith. Now, that might not be your cup of tea or your calling. That's great. But what does God have for you to fulfill by faith?